Done, sir. Prashant, your voice was breaking in the last uh, few sentences. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it clear now, sir? Yes, clear. Yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of NNF Karnataka, I would like to welcome um, all the speakers uh, who have been joining us and uh, all the delegates who have been sparing time. Today, it's really an exciting, uh, it's going to be an exciting webinar session because we're going to talk on the uh, the latest uh, updates in the technology. Integrating the technology with the medicine is what has been done. And today's topic is all about that. So we have three wonderful speakers, uh, Ms. Hila Fredman, Dr. Shoshna Heberman, and uh, Dr. Kishore Kumar. Uh, on behalf of NNF Karnataka, a warm welcome to all of you. And uh, for today's session, uh, we have panelists, Dr. Lina, Dr. Mega, and Dr. Prakash Mehta. Welcome, sir. Welcome, ma'am, for the uh, NNF Karnataka web session. So we are covering today uh, the most important uh, uh, and the latest uh, topic of uh, integrating artificial intelligence in predicting the high-risk pregnancies. And uh, as we know that prevention is always better than cure, Preventing high-risk pregnancy, preventing premature labor and premature delivery is something which can uh, reduce the infant mortality rate. A dream of uh, single-digit infant mortality rate can only be done with prevention. And today we have a wonderful session which will be starting. I request um, uh, Ganesh ji to introduce our speakers to the audience. And then uh, I request uh, Ms. Hila Fredman to start the session. Over to you, Ganesh ji. Uh, good evening, Dr. Prashant. Good evening uh, to all. Uh, I think it's going to be a very, very important session. I think a milestone in uh, maternal and newborn care in our country. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Ms. Hila Friedman, who's a seasonal entrepreneur and CEO and co-founder of Genesis. Ms. Friedman graduated in biomedical engineering of Magna Cum Laude from uh, engineering school at Tel Aviv, Israel. She is a certified data scientist at Stanford. And Ms. Friedman is also a part of AILA Community California University uh, and uh, uh, in the prestigious program in Biodesign in Stanford University. Prior to uh, establishing Genesis, Ms. Friedman served as uh, leading financial, uh, leading business and product development and a knowledge engineer at Siemens Athenaeus. I think it's a privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Hila Friedman and uh, over to you, Hila. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you on the latest advances in AI and how uh, anywhere in the world, uh, you know, especially in US or Europe, where it's already uh, being practiced, we are already seeing uh, great outcomes, and uh, we are very happy to uh, join hands with you to launch this uh, to our neonatologists, obstetricians, and pediatricians in our country. Over to you, Hila. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ganesh. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining uh, this uh, session, um, especially on Sunday. Um, I have uh, the privilege, uh, you know, to join forces uh, with uh, with GenWorks, uh, which is uh, very promising um, in order to bring this uh, technology um, and to leverage it uh, to solve all these uh, things around healthcare, you know, uh, regarding the clinical and the financial implications. Um, I will start um, just one second. Let me share my screen. Please confirm that you can see my screen. Yeah, we can we can see your screen. Perfect. Thank you. So um, as uh, Ganesh started and mentioned um, myself, I am a biomedical engineer, a physicist and data scientist. Um, I've been working in this space um, 14 years now, started from cybersecurity and uh, moved to the healthcare space 12 years ago. And uh, basically, we established Genesis based on a personal story of my professor, where she suffered from um, several uh, medical incidents. I would say that all of them have started from misdiagnosis and ended, unfortunately, in uh, complications. 
Um, so therefore, uh, she encouraged me and joined me and uh, together we established uh, Genesis. And our main goal at Genesis is to change the way that people are diagnosed and treated by predicting disease at the pre-existing conditions. And that means that as uh, you started and, and mentioned, um, the, it is very important to start or to uh, recognize these potential uh, conditions that are about to be happening in the nearest future or in the longest future in order to be able to prevent them and, and instead of trying uh, to, to cure them. So um, we are focusing on two main burdens around the healthcare. So the first one is around the clinical implications that we all know that all these uh, uh, financial clinical implications, the majority of them are predictable and preventable. So um, these uh, medical errors that we are talking about and, you know, all these medical errors that at the end of the, the way are leading to uh, some uh, uh, complications, um, we are talking about on a really uh, significant uh, problem that in the US, for example, we are talking about a problem that is leading to $800 billion everywhere, uh, every year, sorry. And in India, we are talking about 5.2 million cases that are preventable cases. So if we focus on specifically the uh, pregnancy outcomes or maternal neonatal complications, in India there are 3.5 million preterm deliveries every year. And, uh, you know, these, uh, um, these incidents are of course leading uh, to some clinical and financial implications. These implications are starting from misdiagnosis and are ending in these complications. They are leading also to hospitalization days, or many of, of them, and prolonged stays, and admissions to the NICUs, and um, not to mention, you know, um, afterwards, the, the implications that will be for the newborn and, um, and its, its mother is mother or her. Um, and then all these uh, clinical implications are, of course, uh, associated with many financial impacts. So um, as you can see here, we are talking about uh, $37.8 million that are just spending in India for the NICUs. So all these uh, uh, complications that first are preventable uh, even before uh, the, the pregnancy, and I will explain a little bit about it in a few moments. And also, even after we have this uh, um, preterm delivery, there are few ways to handle with these situations in the NICUs in a much more precise way, in a way that we can uh, prevent this uh, future deterioration, okay? Um, so, I had uh, the privilege to actually handle with this uh, amazing uh, opportunity of AI, and as I started and mentioned, um, on almost my whole uh, professional life, I'm working in the artificial intelligence space in different verticals, but in the main vertical, which is the, the healthcare. So I would like now to take you to this uh, journey together with me and to uh, explain you and to provide you a little bit uh, information or an idea about uh, the topic that named AI. And, uh, you know, if we are talking about a revolution, so definitely AI is one of the amazing revolutions that we are just starting and see. But I believe that it will be just uh, going larger and larger over time. 
So what is uh, basically uh, AI or artificial intelligence? So when we are saying AI, mainly we are talking about machines that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. And it can be different things around, uh, you know, different fields. And this scope is pretty broad. But in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the healthcare space. So there are several types of uh, AI, which I will walk through really briefly. So excuse me about it. Um, the first one is the supervised learning. Then we have the unsupervised learning, deep learning and neural networks. Uh, which is definitely the same. And then I will come to the most promising uh, space, in my opinion, uh, which is online and reinforcement learning. So let's start. Um, so when we are talking about uh, supervised learning, we are talking about the... Sorry, someone has a question? Okay. So... Um, I would like to kindly ask you to mute yourself so then we can go through everything fluently. Thank you. Um, so the first uh, the first section that I'm going to talk about is the supervised learning. Um, in the supervised learning, we have data. It doesn't matter which type of data. It can be data that was coming from uh, the EMR or it can be data that is coming from the CT scans or the MRI scans, as you can see on the right side of the screen. And in this data, uh, we are collecting the data and we are labeling this data. So with these labels, we are using them in order to teach the system what is normal and what is abnormal. Okay, so here is just sample, uh, simple examples of HCC. And um, here is another example for normal healthy liver. Okay, so what we are doing is, as I mentioned, we are collecting this raw data. It doesn't matter if it will be any of these data types that I've mentioned. We have our uh, labels that shows us whether it's healthy or not. In this process, the algorithm will learn what are the patterns that returns in the uh, data that of healthy images or other uh, data types and what is abnormal. And then after this process, we will receive all these things which we called uh, classifiers, which are different groups of uh, different uh, labels. What it means, so the red ear can be HCC and the uh, green ear can be the LT deliver and uh, the third one can be different type of uh, cancer. Okay, so different uh, classifiers. Moving on to unsupervised, excuse me, moving on to unsupervised learning, as I mentioned before then, Supervised learning is, um, just one second, um, supervised learning is the uh, learning that we can, uh, that we do have the labels, which means that we do have uh, someone uh, which can be, uh, you know, physician or other people uh, from the medical staff label this data and they recognize what is healthy and what is not. In unsupervised learning, it is the opposite thing. We are providing the machine different, it can be different images, it can be, uh, in this case, you can see here that we have cats and dogs, but it can be um, the HCC that I showed before then, and LT levers, meaning LT uh, images with LT liver, and other examples like it. The first thing that we are doing is to recognize the pattern, the second step, sorry, to provide the uncategorized uh, images or data. The second step will be to recognize these patterns and based on these patterns to make these predictions. So there are main, two main types of this thing in the uh, healthcare space. The first one is clustering, where we want to find similar things. 
Okay, so similar groups uh, or a big group can be cancer in general speaking, or we can drill down to the specific cancer that we want to find in the image or the signal or other data type. The other one will be the anomaly detection where we want to find what is abnormal in the pattern. Okay, so we have LP pattern or we have the majority and in the in the uh, medical space it is pretty straightforward because uh, uh, the majority of the people are healthy and therefore it's uh, pretty straightforward to use such technology as anomaly detection because we have a lot of examples of healthy people but and in, if something is out of the range or if something is if something is abnormal, then we can detect it pretty easily. And I will give you just a simple example of the ECG patterns, right? So um, this one is an uh, unlabeled ECG with arrhythmia. And what we'll do, we'll take all the images of ECG or the signals or the raw data itself. And based on these images or based on the signal itself, we will detect the regions that we found to be abnormal, that are going out of the pattern. Going on to the deep learning and neural network, I think that this is the most uh, famous one um, in, this, uh, in this space so far, so I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard of, uh, you know, neural networks and deep learning and uh, and they are pretty much exactly the same thing. And um, the idea behind it is exactly to take the structure of a typical neuron of our brain to mimic the work of our brain or to mimic the way that we are thinking. I have to say that is way far from what uh, from the way that our brain is working. But um, that was the idea. So that's exactly what we uh, have done here. So you can see here that the inputs are the dendrites and the weights are the exons, right? And uh, actually we sum it up and then uh, we decide to what, based on the weight, we decide to which information or based on which information we are going to make the decision. Again, it's really uh, in eye level, but this is the, the idea behind it. There are different uh, there are different structures of these neural nets or deep learning, but simply the only difference between them is just the structure of the neural network. So deep learning neural nets are uh, exactly the same thing and how it works. So um, I will give you just a simple example of this process of how we train a neural network and how it works behind the scenes. So the first thing that we are doing, as always, we are providing the raw data. The raw data can be everything. Um, the majority of the work that I've done so far using deep learning and neural nets uh, techniques uh, was on images, so that's the reason that I brought this uh, this uh, example. Um, so we have here different uh, animals as an input. So it can be, you know, here it's animals, but it can definitely be different, uh, you know, images like uh, MRI scans, CT scans, uh, ultrasound scans, etc. So um, what we are doing is to train these models. And how we train these models? The first layer will be just the edges. So we are detecting the edges. It is very high level. And we just looking into the edges. Afterwards, we are starting to recognize organs. And in the top layer, we are starting to connect all these findings that we have seen in the layers before to make a decision about the output. And this is exactly what you can see here. So it's 10% wolf and it's 90% dog. In this case, we are going to uh, 
make a decision based on the uh, last layer or the top layer and uh, and actually what we have defined to be um, the threshold between being dog or detecting as a dog or detecting as a wolf. And this is exactly what we are doing with uh, examples like brain scans. So it can be um, the threshold, what is this stroke or what it is not, or what it is COVID on CT scan and what is not. And if we will take X-ray, what is uh, pneumonia or what is not pneumonia, etc. So these fine tunings are very important to make sure that we don't have a lot of false alerts on one end, but on the other end, we don't want to miss uh, important data. Um, and the last one, but as I mentioned before, then, uh, before then. I think that it's the most promising one is the reinforcement learning. And here is how reinforcement learning works. So we have again our input raw data, which can be the same things, EMR data, lab tests, genetic data, images, etc. And inside this process, we have an, an, an agent this agent is giving rewards or penalties to the algorithm and what it means. So, for example, um, in the real life, what we are doing as uh, babies, right? So we are starting to uh, we are starting to walk or we are starting uh, when we learn how to talk. Someone is actually helping us by giving us uh, continuous feedback. This feedback is our best way to learn. So that's exactly the idea with the reinforcement learning. We are starting from a baseline, we are providing these uh, predictions, and then we are giving the, mo the model continuous, uh, continuous feedback. Using this feedback, the algorithm actually fixing itself until we have the final output. And this final output can be based on the developer of the uh, algorithm. So I will give you one example. If we decided that we would like to reduce um, the diabetes chances, okay, by providing uh, medications, what we will do we will decide that, for example, if the patient reached 100 uh, milligram per deciliter, it's uh, it's fair enough, let's say, for us, and we can stop this uh, this process. Otherwise, we will keep providing recommendations that will lead to reduce in the diabetes uh, levels. So this is very important, and it's very important that the developer that is dealing with such uh, problems in the AI space will be familiar, very familiar with this space um, in order to provide the right direction to the models. And this is very important part. I'm going to touch it a bit uh, later in a couple of moments. So what can be after all this explanation? what is the impact that artificial intelligence uh, potentially, because now it's still uh, building itself, I would say, in the healthcare space, and I really have the honor to, to lead our company um, to be one of the first companies that really step um, uh, into different uh, different spaces in the AI and the impact that, uh, on the healthcare. So the first thing, it's a more precise decisions, of course, because the, as I mentioned, the system, the algorithm has the capabilities to see thousands of different data elements, not only on the patient that you see at the moment, but on other patients, which for us as human beings will be very challenging or just impossible. 
So with this, going through all the data that in the system and all the data that have analyzed on hundreds and thousands of patients, we can have a more precise decision. So I want here to quote Dr. Golden that is saying the more accurate we get and the sooner we get to the right diagnosis, the better we are going to be. That's what digital pathology and AI has the opportunity to deliver. The second thing, as I mentioned before, then reduce, of course, misdiagnosis and complications. And here is the reason. If we are providing what will be the likely, what is the likelihood that each of these patients will develop or not, uh, not necessarily patients or each of these people will develop any of uh, these conditions, then we have the opportunity to intervene early and prevent these incidents. So just one example that is pretty straightforward. We would prefer to uh, recognize that someone has a BRCA, BRCA gene in order to uh, prevent uh, future breast cancer than to start uh, doing these interventions when the patient is, or is already at uh, cancer stage four. So this is pretty straightforward uh, reason. And of course, when we are starting these interventions earlier, then we are preventing also the complications that will be due to these misdiagnosis or late diagnosis. Um, the third thing is uh, revealing hidden areas in the data and solving enigmas. So, so far with the tools that we had, we reached actually the top of, of, um, of the humanity capabilities. So now with the AI and the possibilities, again, to see all the data, to see all the different interactions and to work through this, we have now the possibility also to solve enigmas. And one of them, of course, it's the uh, preterm delivery that still nowadays it's an enigma. Again, I'm, I'm really um, honored uh, to have this opportunity to be uh, a part of this company that is actually opening this black box using these uh, tools. The fourth thing is, of course, improve decision making. Um, the same as I mentioned before. So uh, since we have the capability to diagnose early and to diagnose in real time and uh, to make sure that we are not missing any of these points, it is improving also the decision making and make it more precise. The fifth thing is automation processes. Of course, that we are leveraging uh, the artificial intelligence to automate these processes and by doing so to reduce the cost. The machine, it's like a, um, a manufacturer. The machine is keep working and we can make sure that, that all the processes are automated, which is very important in the medical space especially. And I will touch it in uh, one moment uh, because as we know, there are different, uh, of course, physicians, and each of them are doing different uh, decisions in the same identical, in identical situations, uh, which lead uh, to uh, challenges around making decisions in the future. I will mention this in a moment. And of course, as I mentioned before then, it has the opportunity to reduce misdiagnosis complications and hospitalization days and readmissions. Um, and final thing here is that it has the possibility to expanding care to rural areas. So unfortunately, we don't have neither in the States and also in, in India and in other places, we don't have the specialists everywhere. And with artificial intelligence that have learned, you know, algorithms that have learned everything for, from the best practices and, uh, and so different uh, populations on diverse, uh, 
on diverse populations, actually, we can take this technology and bring this care to everywhere. Um, and after all, just to summarize all these advantages, it saves life, time and money. So what are the, after all these great things that I've said about, uh, about AI, and definitely there is uh, huge potential in this space, we need to be aware of several challenges, uh, specifically in the medical space. So the first thing, as we all know, there are a lot of unnecessary medical tests uh, which are leading to sparse data, and I will explain both. So all of us or all over the, the world, we have uh, different uh, medical tests that are recommended uh, for different situations. But um, at the end of it, um, each of the physicians or the medical staff uh, may make a decision based on their understanding of the situation. And for example, um, let's say that um, one of the physicians send uh, the patient to CBC test, just a simple lab test, and the um, the results have returned with uh, abnormality within the WBC, uh, white blood cells. So now there are a lot of options as what to do next to send this patient to an additional lab test, to send this patient uh, to imaging uh, tests, to send this patient uh, to again, additional tests from different types, um, hospitalize these patients. There are a lot of uh, uh, possibilities here. That, uh, that leads to the situation of sparse data. And what is sparse data? When we have one patient and uh, this patient, let's say, diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So we have patient A and now we have patient B and patient A and patient B as different, totally different lab tests or other tests as well. So, for example, for patient A, we have different 100 tests, and for patient B, we can be in a situation that they have almost nothing or maybe just demographics data or some of uh, um, other, you know, uh, medical tests that lead uh, to the situation that we see really different picture on the same or around the identical situation, which led me to the uh, third point, which is strong dependence on diverse decisions in identical situations. As I ex just explained, there are different decisions that physicians are making in identical situations. That lead us to the uh, issues that I just mentioned uh, before. And the fourth thing, that we have uh, biased decisions based on specific history. So if we have a specific picture, then uh, it is making us to go in a specific way and actually biasing the uh, decision making. So these are all the challenges or some of the challenges, but the most uh, or the largest challenges in of AI in the medical space. I would add even one more uh, one more thing around them. Um, that is the uh, the way that we are collecting data in the medical space that is definitely different from other spaces. Um, so this is um, all about the, the challenges. So what about the, the current status of the uh, AI in the medical space? So right now, uh, the majority of uh, the companies or the methods um, and the algorithms that uh, are being used in the medical space are more for detection. 
and I know that it might be or it may be uh, pretty confusing the use that you know companies or individuals um, in terms of that are using in terms like um, detection or prediction which is two different things detection is our uh, capability to recognize something from the image from the signal from the lab test etc prediction is our capability um, to um, to see what is the likelihood that this patient will develop this disease in the nearest future or in the farthest future. Um, so these are two different things. Um, de detection are more aligning with the current uh, medical space where we are uh, seeing patients and we are detecting specific uh, specific disease at the right moment. Uh, prediction is more like screening tools that are telling us what is the likelihood that this patient will have this specific um, this specific uh, diagnosis. So what are the the main uh, uh, the main uh, uh, methods that are in the medical space currently? So the first one is the rule based model. What it means, uh, for example, if someone is obese or have, uh, or has uh, I uh, BMI, that means that they will uh, develop uh, um, hypertension or they have I likely to develop hypertension tension, for example. Uh, we have also uh, imaging and computer vision techniques that I'm sure that you all heard of, uh, you know, detecting um, different uh, disease over these images like uh, detection of, um, of uh, stroke on uh, CT scans or detection of pneumonia on x-ray or detection of COVID on uh, on uh, CT scans as well, uh, on MRI. There are a lot of uh, uh, techniques around it. Um, the disadvantage of these techniques, again, is that they are seeing or they are detecting only what they see. That means that only if something is on the image, meaning that it is already there, just then they will detect it, but they can't recognize something behind the scenes. Uh, so it's a great tool for automating things, but it's not uh, it's not helping us in the prevention or in the preventive healthcare. Um, and the third thing um, is the same, but just uh, for digital signal processing. So as I showed before them, um, we have an ECG uh, signal and through this uh, on on this uh, ECG signal we can detect anomalies like uh, arrhythmia or uh, uh, MI etc so what what we have done in this space um, that uh, that is different from uh, what we have currently, in the medical space in general speaking. So I would like to divide our uh, SPY platform to five different sections, and I will now associate everything that I just explained before then regarding the different types of algorithms that we have under AI to what we are providing here. So the first thing that we do is a more precise diagnosis. Um, as I mentioned before then, the first thing is that we have uh, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of misdiagnosis. Um, that can be due to this sparsity within the data, that can be uh, because of we have different, uh, uh, different medical tests per patient and then we see just a small picture instead of looking on the bigger picture. 
and then and that can be because sometimes people are typing in uh, wrong data inside the EMR systems, the electronic medical record systems. Therefore, uh, what we have done is to collect all the data. And the first thing that we are doing using um, the well known uh, standards, let's say, um, based on the WHO or the CDC. We are taking this data, we are reviewing this data, of course, by, by our algorithms, and we are providing this detection part. In this part, we also use, uh, as I mentioned before then, imaging techniques, and uh, for example, to uh, detect pneumonia, to detect breast cancer on mammograms, to detect uh, um, COVID on CT scans, etc. But the advantage here is that we are able to connect different data types to complete the whole picture. So this is the first uh, step. The second step, um, as I mentioned before then, we are providing the predictions of pre-existing conditions. And how we have done this? So. We have built SPY based on data that we have collected worldwide on over 300,000 patients. Very diverse data, very diverse population, different data types. And right now we are one of the only companies around the world that are analyzing any data type and using these uh, data that we have collected, we recognize new patterns and new parameters that are shedding light on the potential of these patients to develop these conditions. So we are providing these predictions of pre-existing conditions. In the pregnancy, we have six, by the way, we have six different modules. And in the module that uh, we are providing predictions around OBGYN, we are starting at the preconception phase. And I would like to share with you a quick story about it. Um, so uh, when um, when my professor approached me with with her, uh, with her personal story, she told me, so I'm suffering from these uh, uh, abortions and I'm suffering from these miscarriages um, and preterm births and all of the physicians have told me we don't see any issue. Um, so it seems like that is something that we don't see, that we are missing here. And uh, when we started um, uh, to collect uh, the data, we assumed that there is nothing that can happen out of the blue, meaning if something happens inside a pregnancy, that means that in high probability, let's say, we can predict some of these, not all of them, of course, but some of these conditions before the pregnancy. And that's exactly what we've done. So our predictions, in our predictions, we are starting at the preconception phase. Then we keep updating these predictions all uh, in the whole process of uh, throughout the whole process of pregnancy and of course the postpartum as well the third part is the prediction of uh, of illness of the progression of illness and as i just uh, mentioned in order to show what are the changes in the course of pregnancy. So let's say that we started uh, from uh, one baseline and what now, even if we didn't or if you didn't do any intervention or even if the patient looks uh, definitely uh, normal in terms of the, the medical status, of course. Um, so that doesn't mean that nothing has changed. And we want to make sure that this uh, woman will complete her pregnancy um, in a normal way, let's say. That's the reason that we keep providing this pro progression of illness. So I would like to show you what does it mean. 
So here, uh, as I just mentioned, we have different conditions that we are providing. Um, on each of these uh, conditions, we are providing whether the prediction is positive or negative, meaning if the patient will develop this disease or will not develop this disease. And here you can see that we have different uh, types of conditions. Also, as I mentioned, we are providing the severity of illness. And why it's so important to predict what is the severity of illness? in order to show or to reflect what is the severity of this specific uh, disease and also to enable the physicians, the medical staff, to see what is the impact of their interventions. But, you know, uh, immediate, the immediate impact of these uh, uh, interventions, because we don't want to uh, waste precious time here, if something is not working, uh, so then you can uh, you can see it immediately. Also, we are providing what are the features that we have found to be important using our algorithms. And um, the other thing that we are providing is the diagnosis part. In the diagnosis part, as I mentioned before then, we are reviewing all the data that is in the system and we, uh, we are diagnosing the current status of the patient. So our main goal always will be that the prediction date will be before the actual result date, which is the diagnosis date, of course. Moving forward from the maternal uh, part to the neonatal part, we have connected between the maternal and the neonatal medical status, and that was very important to do because inside uh, the pregnancy, um, there are two different uh, things that we see, and it was very important to predict from the uh, from the perinatal. Uh, time until the postpartum to see what are the expected uh, what are the expected disease after uh, just after the uh, pregnancy with the delivery meaning so uh, in this gap between the moment that uh, the woman is delivering the baby to the moment that this baby is reaching the neonatology or the NICU it was very important to fill this gap and to provide the neonatologists not only the all information about the course of pregnancy, but also the information about uh, about this baby and what to expect to, so they will be able to start and treating this baby, especially in the new queue, in the very first day. And that all uh, what, you know, the AI enables us to do by predicting all these, uh, all these disease. So in addition to that, um, it was very important. And now, of course, we can see it in the very significantly in the COVID times that is important to keep tracking and monitoring these patients even remotely. So I would like to share with you here what, what we have done with this. And our idea was to take the baseline as uh, the all data that we have inside the hospital and then to connect it to other devices or other questionnaires that we can actually do remotely and to keep tracking this patient to make sure that this patient is going and improving or nothing that is abnormal is uh, happening during the course of pregnancy. So that's exactly what you can see here. We are starting here from the data that we have within the electronic medical record and using the connection that we have done to other wellness watch, we keep tracking this, uh, this patient. By the way, uh, it helps us to see what is the behavior of the patient. 
because for example let's say that we have one patient that uh, at the preconception phase we found to have high likelihood to develop gestational diabetes um, one of the interventions may be, you know, the, the changes in the lifestyle. But now we want to see, we want to see what, what is the changes and what is the commitment of this patient to these changes in the lifestyle. So we can use this data that we are collecting from other uh, third party companies in order to feed in in our algorithm and keep doing these live recommendations on these patients and then to help you know the physicians to make a, a more precise decision on the next steps or on the uh, next interventions and then you can see here um, that this patient is now pregnant and then these are the predictions okay so she is now in nine weeks plus five days this is the current situation and this is the prediction um, also we enable um, these patients to connect um, the physicians remotely or to uh, go back to the um, to their uh, own uh, physicians and have a frontal appointment. So again, all these connections are very important in the balance or in the connect or in the combination between the detection uh, capabilities that the AI is bringing us and the prediction capabilities. And this uh, and this combination puts us in a place that we can provide the physicians a very strong tool that based on this tool they can do not only more precise uh, decisions and more accurate uh, decisions but also to see um, these uh, patients uh, progression and to manage care better. And in the last point, um, we wanted to take the precision ma medicine and make it a reality. And um, it was very important to see how we can use all this uh, information that we are providing, which we start with the diagnosis and then we, uh, we uh, continue with the predictions of pre-existing condition and then we are predicting also what will be the progression of illness and then we are helping to tracking and monitor these uh, patients and the fifth part is um, to help the physicians to make a more precise uh, decision on what will be the, uh, the most impactful a treatment or intervention for a specific patient. So I would like to, to show you um, two examples of it. Um, the one, as I mentioned, we are creating this patient profile, we are taking different treatments, and then we are recommending or showing what will be the severity of illness under these treatments. Um, we have done this very successfully even out of the uh, um, maternal or pregnancy space and in the COVID uh, we took different uh, treatments uh, that were uh, possible um, one treatment was uh, dexamethasone the second treatment uh, was remdesivir the, the third treatment um, uh, was plasma and etc etc um, and we use these uh, predictions to combine between them and see what will be the outcome what will be the severity of illness under each of these predictions and you can see it also inside the pregnancy so this is the detection part and as i mentioned and this is the uh, live recommendations where in the black line you see what will be the prediction of glucose levels without any intervention and what will be the uh, prediction of these glucose levels under each of these interventions. 
So it's kind of a sophisticated simulator that will leverage, if I was talking about the powerful tool uh, of uh, recommendation systems and reinforcement learning, which is the last section that I touched uh, when I explained about uh, AI. So here you can see why it's so powerful, because it enables us to see what will be the outcome even under different interventions along the way. So if you think about it, it's kind of uh, Google Maps or the ways that even before uh, we are starting the, the driving, we can, uh, we can see what to expect to in our way. So it will give us the estimation so we can uh, estimate when, uh, when we need to leave our homes and when we are going to reach the, um, the place. The other thing that it is doing, it is keep predicting and updating the, um, the estimation time, but not only it is flagging us on, on uh, some, uh, some challenges that we may have uh, along the way. So this is exactly it, and, uh, and the third thing that we are reaching here is that it will recommend us on changes in the way if it sees that this way that we are on now is not the shortest way or it's not the best way uh, to reach the, the place, but we have a better way to take. This is exactly it. The last thing that I wanted to show you is actually the top of this combination between these different techniques that I've just touched, which is taking the detection part and taking the prediction part and taking also the what we called the uh, IoT or uh, Internet of Things or how we connect the radiology uh, tools to be more precise, to be automated, um, and to leverage this technology in order to recognize these defects before something is happened. So what you can see here, and we present as the SPIDE, the next generation of radiology tools, we have used an add-on on the uh, ultrasound or the regular ultrasound transducer we connected all the data from the EMR through the uh, ultrasound system to not only detect, but to use this EMR data to predict on the uh, image what is the, uh, what is the abnormality that we see, or if it's uh, healthy, of course, as well. And then we teach this uh, brain, this machine, how uh, the physicians or what is the position of the physician's end during the uh, during the examination, the ultrasound examination. That enables us to build a robot that is mimic mimic actually mimics all the uh, process from the moment that uh, we define what is the purpose of the examination until we are doing or performing all the course of examination by the robot that just mimic the physician's end. And then it is doing also the uh, aggregation of data and it is doing also the prediction on the image. But think about it now if we have such diversity or such differences and uh, I had the, the honor to be in the ultrasound unit for uh, Siemens Elsineers and such differences between one system to another and between one physician to another, think about how we can minimize this process to the moment that the physician just need to make the decision. So we are leveraging this tool in order to provide the physicians the power to make a more precise and more accurate decisions. So I would like to uh, complete my talk uh, with Fei Fei Li. Um, she's uh, very, uh, very unique in this space.
and she's uh, with uh, Sequoia Capital and a professor of computer science at Stanford University. And she says the day healthcare can fully embrace AI is the day we have a revolution in terms of cutting costs and improving care. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope that you find it interesting. I would love to, to address uh, your questions um, later on. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I believe that uh, now Dr. Aberman uh, should yeah. join us in a yeah. few moments, or I see that she's here. So I will uh, share uh, share my screen. Um, let me. Hi. Um, Hi. Good afternoon. Here it's my morning. I, so yeah. Oh, great. I'm in New York. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, just uh, share my screen with your presentation. I let Ila get the slides uh, because it it made it easier. So Ila will bring up my slides. In the meanwhile, just brief introduction. I'm the director of maternal fetal medicine at Maimonides Medical Center. We are the largest obstetrical service in New York State and one of the large in the country. And uh, <clears throat> besides being the director of maternal fetal medicine, I'm also the director of uh, medical informatics for OBGYN and member of the hospital task, task force in medical informatics. Uh, doing it for so many years, uh, I got deep interest in artificial intelligence and machine learning system, asking myself how can we improve our processes, which as everybody which practice medicine these days knows that we have many issues with uh, analyzing data, quality of data, overwhelming amount of data element which we are being bombarded with and it's very difficult to pick up out from all of those uh, data element the ones which are really important for us and a lot of uh, processes and the uh, protocols that we are using basically based on data when when you start to dig into was not analyzed in the most accurate and obviously not that precise for the individual patient. So I started to work with the live to say I don't have any conflict of interest. I don't have any shares, anything in the company. I'm just working with the law as a clinician and the uh, person which uh, needs accurate, precise data to manage my patients. So the place of artificial intelligence, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, the way that we can use it is summarized in this slide, creating more precise analytics for images, pathology or radiology images, and I would say that uh, Jeffrey Golden, that we are now getting to the point where we can do a better job of assessing whether a cancer is going to progress rapidly or slowly and how that might change how patients will be treated based on the algorithm rather than clinical staging or the histopathological grade. And if we can, I, assume that most of the audience are in the neonatal field, let's assume that uh, we, we do now imaging of the fetal brain, we find certain things, and when, you, when we deliver the baby and you get the neonate, it's very difficult 
to predict the neurological outcome, the development outcome, based on just the imaging. As everybody knows, uh, <clears throat> we see certain things in our uh, fetal ultrasound that immediately after delivery, delivery you might not see, but things might uh, show later on in life. And I think that right now it's an enigma how to follow, how to manage, and how to consult these patients. So that's one of the areas which uh, can be improved a lot by using AI and machine learning. We can improve productivity by identifying features of interest in the medical data before human clinician review the data. Because if instead of looking at 40 pages of record that someone brings to me on patient with uh, some adverse obstetrical outcome, I can get precise information focused and guy highlighting the most essential elements in the situation. Obviously, I'm saving time and I can be more productive in how I'm counseling the patient. And also, if I have a <clears throat> population, if I'm dealing with population and I'm trying to solve some problem which being identified in this population, obviously more accurate information can help us to solve those problems. And this is real. We are seeing it using those type of systems. Now, bringing intelligence to medical devices and machines, obviously, obviously pattern recognition and some of our challenging is how to analyze fetal heart rate. Still, the precise uh, information is not there. There is a lot of information into this uh, fetal heart rate monitors, but we, we are missing certain points that only machine can address for us. Our eyes are especially trends, which uh, it's almost impossible to do trend analysis and obviously radiology data. Now, bringing a intelligent to assess our ability to identify early sign of deterioration is one of the most important things for me. Because we see, as Ila mentioned in her lecture, you can see three patients which present to you almost with the same picture, but one of them will develop a condition and the other two will not. The, the capability to, uh, to identify the one which I need to target for more testing or for earlier intervention is very important. And all of us know about those patients which look completely normal and all of the sudden deteriorated. And as the last said, this is continuum. Uh, the system enables you to detect patients from preconception toward pregnancy and during labor and even postpartum. And I don't need to tell you as a neonatologist how many conditions uh, present later on, but when you really look backward, you find already the early signs of they're there. Enhancing the clinical decision making with artificial intelligence at bedside, it's really important for me because that's again, we are missing a lot of things, and systems like that can pick up the essential from the data and can help us to provide more precise information, identifying uh, and highlighting elements that are important to manage the patient. Also, as Ila mentioned, we know that different physicians are managing situation in a different way. That's part of the thing that can be entered into algorithm because at certain point, you can provide different alert to different providers based on their behavior and their part and their way of managing patient. Uh, next one, Hila, please, next. Okay, so uh, the artificial intelligence uh, can 
help with analyzing imaging better digital better digital signal processes in fetal heart rate EKG for example and also highlight and analyze uh, EMR data much better and also combined a lot of we we are bombarded with information which come from many uh, EMR or many sources uh, of data and only system like that can combine all the elements together, put them, and also it's very important to clean the data as far as hierarchy, because you might find some lab which come from a certain entry to a record, and from the other end you have lab results which stream directly from the lab. So those systems can clean those data elements by hierarchy and kick out the ones which the system by artificial intelligence uh, machine learning process knows that those data elements are not coming from a uh, reliable sources. And gather, obviously gather all the signal together. Ila, next one. So we looked at a uh, prediction of bridges we looked at several um, adverse pregnancy outcome prediction models, and we built those prediction models based on a huge number of patients we had in our database in order to get the training part, about 100,000 deliveries, and ILA had also in their database several hundred thousand from other resources, and the mathematical model was built based on an analysis of many patients. So we are aware that the genetic data is very important. However, most of the system do not include that data. And even in our sophisticated systems, the genetic data comes in a format that not always we can uh, analyze it. Uh, accurately. Uh, we are making now some efforts to get into the core of this gene genetic data that we have on our patients, but we, we decided to take a surrogate, uh, some demographic parameters that usually are not included in a detailed analysis. We looked at language, religion, besides, besides race and ethnicity, we added the, we added the religion and the language. And we found that uh, there were significant differences in the probability to develop gestational diabetes based on uh, just religion. And one of the things which was interesting that in our population, the Jehovian witness were at the highest risk to develop it even more than by tradition, we saw that the Orthodox Jewish community, which is uh, usually um, Eastern Europe community, were at much higher risk. Ilan, next slide. So that's one of the things that, Ilan, next please, that can highlight it. So when we, did, when we worked on the model, it was clear that we have to develop different prediction model for based on religion. So for that example, the performance of that model on Jewish uh, patients, uh, we got a specificity of 99.3 and sensitivity of 65. And on just the Christian model, let me have to yeah, on the Christian model, we got 98 specificity and 88 sensitivity. So it shows how different uh, even religions factor can have different impact on your prediction model. Ila, the next one. Now, that's another example of something that we overlook and uh, this is not, these parameters never came 
to all the analysis of prediction of gestational diabetes or risk, risk development of gestational diabetes. The system, the prediction model uh, brought up that uh, besides the number of pregnancies and the number of uh, prior pregnancies affected by diabetes, the, one of the most important factors is if the gestational diabetes was on the last pregnancy or was earlier. And you can see on that uh, model, you can see here on that results that, uh, for example, patient with four, Ila, can you highlight it? Four pregnancies, but, and two patients, one, one at four pregnancies, and two prior gestational diabetes, and the other one had four pregnancy and two previous gestational diabetes, but one of them had the last pregnancy with gestational diabetes, and you could see that the probability changed from 20 to 45% just by putting the order of the gestational diabetes in those pregnancies. And this can be done in the preconception uh, time, we did this mo these predictions in preconception on preconception data. Next one, Ila. Ila, next one. So, and uh, other things which came up with our prediction model were a lot of uh, blood tests and other factors, which some of them are clear to us, like age, body mass index, but some of them were not uh, really intuitive. Ilan, next one. And as well as different lab tests, which, uh, as you see, change the probability for the development of gestational diabetes. And one of the interesting things was toxoplasma infection, cholesterol again, we know that people with hyperlipidemia might develop it, but things like toxoplasma or nucleated red blood cells came as factors. And if you really think, next slide, if you really think about what it is, we, the body is the whole body and each disease as impact on other factors in the body and also is being triggered by all systems, hormonal, the hormonal system affected, the immuno, immunological system, the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, every system in the body contributes to the outcome. So, this kind of uh, artificial intelligence based methods can pull out those special elements from each person, bring them up and make the difference between two patients which on the surface look exactly the same, but even with certain little differences, basically have a big difference in the outcome of certain disease. Um, that's basically some picture that I took from one of the one of the books showing how all the systems are connected, but that I understand I guess that you understand the whole idea that we are picking up elements from every system which naturally and by our regular knowledge we might not even think to pick those elements can you bring can you bring the next slide so the artificial intelligence system has the capability based on analysis of large data, 
to learn the situation and provide us with uh, different elements which are important to make the diagnosis and predict the outcome. And by this way can help us to influence and affect the outcome by early intervention. In gestational diabetes, it's obviously simple. If we predict pre-gestational diabetes, there are a lot of ways that we can intervene even before the patient gets pregnant. And Ila showed basically these busy slides before. So let's go back, Ila, to the previous slide. Ila, can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. So prediction from preconception phase to prenatal and postpartum can be done more efficiently by using system like that. And it has significant importance because early intervention can change the outcome. And in diabetes, as we said, obviously the dietary intervention, physical activity, a combined diet and physical activity, and sometimes pharmaceutical intervention, and there are other interventions that can be done. And I would like to go please to the previous slide. So I would like to emphasize that it's not only one point at the course of the patient uh, encounter with us or with some other people. We see if we see the patient as preconception, we can track down the intervention. As Ila showed you, we have a way to track down what intervention helps. So sometimes we see the patient early in pregnancy. We know from our experience that certain medication uh, work on certain people, certain medication do not uh, work on certain people. And this system enables us to give more precise uh, treatment to patient. Monitor and tracking during pregnancy is another lab back. Monitoring and tracking the iris patients during their pregnancy is also important, and those system can guideline on how often we have to see the system, the patients, and who are the patient which is as more severe situation and with the patient which L situation will not deteriorate. And that's important for monitoring patients. Then the system can also predict outcomes during labor and postpartum. And I have to say, we put, uh, we put the example of uh, gestational diabetes because we did a lot on that and we uh, published um, already, but we are working on other outcomes. And I had just a striking uh, case that we just starting to put the preeclampsia uh, prediction outcome. We had a patient that uh, presented at 39 weeks with borderline elevated hypertension, was delivered, uh, diagnosed as as hypertension, she had also gestational diabetes in the background. She was delivered as gestational hypertension, three days in the hospital, stable, was discharged with no uh, events, sequelae, any things that on our radar were highlighted. The patient, this is the right part of the screen. This patient was discharged and 10 days after that, she was admitted with hemorrhagic stroke to another hospital, was transferred to us. And unfortunately at that time, I, we didn't use that as active, the preeclampsia prediction. I looked backward and it happened that she had 
two medical record numbers. So it's not like looking backward to what the system predicted. On the day of the discharge, that's what the system predicted, stroke by 73.55. And then the patient had slow recovery and she's in a rehabilitation place right now, doing better. And when we took further history on her after she could communicate, it happened that she was, she was told to measure blood pressure at home, but she was not that uh, compliant with that. A few days after the delivery, she measured the blood pressure. It was 140 over 90. She saw that she was uh, in pain and uh, upset, and she ignored it. Then she started to have some headache. Only the next day, she had severe headache, collapsed at home, and was brought to the hospital. Obviously, this patient, if we would have this prediction or upon discharge, which theoretically we had it, but at that time we still didn't use those predictions on the preeclampsia model, we could probably prevent that outcome because this patient would be monitored very carefully uh, her blood pressure would be watched very carefully and there would be intervention immediately when her blood pressure would go up. So that's one of the examples which system like that can do that. And the right side is another patient that came also with, some, with COVID and was completely stable and then all of a the sudden deteriorated the system on the day of admission, before everything happened, predicted preterm delivery and sepsis and ventilation. She was she ended in the ICU ventilating. So there is power to of there is prediction power over here. And Ila, can you move to the previous slide? So there is prediction power and uh, basically using those system, I'm completely convinced that the way to proceed with medicine these days is to develop those system, learn how to use them, validate them, which uh, you know is part of the process and understanding that uh, while this artificial intelligence will not come at once, early adopters in their practices will be ready to be future leaders in healthcare. Because I think that in the current status of uh, data and overwhelming data and more and more information that needed to us in order to manage patients. There is no other way to deal with healthcare systems rather than work on those systems, develop them and adopt them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oshana. Um, moving to the next, right? Thank you, thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next topic. Wonderful presentation. A lot of questions. We'll take up this question on this uh, I request uh, uh, Shurkumar, uh, sir. Yes? I am able to hear you, actually. Can, can I, you hear me? I have to say, I, I have to detach from you because I'm covering service and I'm already eight minutes late. So I have to run to the hospital. So I think that Ila is capable to answer most of the questions. And if you have anything special, you can email me. Uh, I can send you my email and Ila can provide you with my email as well. So have a, best, have a nice day, the rest of your day. And bye. Thank you so bye. much. Thank you very much, Ravana.
thank you, Sushana and uh, <coughs> Dr. Prashant. Uh, will you be introducing Dr. Kishore for the next talk? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Kishore Kumar, sir, he is the vice president of NNF uh, National Neonatal Forum, Karnataka State Chapter. He is the founder director of Cloud9 Group of Hospital. He is the uh, Harvard security uh, uh, holder uh, in healthcare management. And uh, he's a pioneer in India to start a concept of mother and child, which has uh, revolutionized the uh, uh, concept, you know, mother and child healthcare system in India. And he's been one of the pine. He's been the pioneer in setting up this trend in India. And uh, he has got uh, many awards and many. Uh, it takes a lot of time to uh, go in uh, uh, detail of every achievement what he has done. So. Uh, I request now Kishore Kumar sir to, to uh, start the session and give a, a, a brief introduction about uh, the concept. What do you sir? Good evening, Prashant, and good evening, Ganesh Prasad. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, before I start, I want to congratulate uh, both Hila and uh, Dr. Shoshana for the wonderful presentation and the great work they have done in artificial intelligence. Uh, for those of you who may not realize, artificial intelligence takes a lot of time. In fact, we had been working on the similar sort of things for uh, quite a number of uh, um, months and a couple of years and uh, still nowhere uh, this close. The good thing about neonatology is neonatology is a very youngest branch of medicine and uh, as you can see it's less than 60 years old and uh, clearly um, that makes uh, one of the young medicines with the evidence-based medicine. So it is a uh, it is an area where artificial intelligence can make a huge difference and uh, you can see the major milestones which has happened in the neonatology is most of them are in the last century. 21st century is yet to come up with uh, uh, any major milestones and I'm sure artificial intelligence is going to make a huge difference. If you look at artificial intelligence in neonatology, when you do a Google search and uh, <clears throat> Um, there were uh, 7,260 in the Google search, whereas in PubMed there are only 62 articles on artificial intelligence in neonatology. Harvard Business Review talks about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in various things, but neonatology is mentioned passing by. So neonatology is not in the major area of many uh, people. And uh, the, if you look at the latest data available from Government of India, uh, we have uh, still one of the highest uh, mortality uh, in India. And if you look at uh, Karnataka, it is one of the better places to deliver a newborn compared to the worst states, which are Chhattisgarh, Bihar, Assam, Jharkhand, and Rajasthan. So the progress with the neonatal mortality rate has been very slow, but steady, but it's painfully slow in India. And uh, with the Southern India doing better than the middle part of India compared to the rest of India. So the funds available, there is enough funds available, but it needs to be used in the right sense. Now, why is artificial intelligence matters to India in a big way, especially in neonatology, is because India accounts for almost 27 million births, out of which 13 million <coughs> babies are born free term. And preterm babies, we all know that high risk of death due to neonatal infections, high risk of developmental uh, delays, high risk due to cerebral palsy, poor school performance, and increased uh, chronic disease in adulthood like uh, cardiovascular disease. And we all know that uh, not all preterm babies are the same. If we can have artificial intelligence to identify the risk factors for the late preterm and extreme preterm, we will save a lot of babies from mortality and morbidity in a big way. Artificial intelligence neonatology is quite challenging, uh, uh, people think, but it's actually, if you break it down, as Hila showed in maternity, 
they have done such a wonderful job. It's all about algorithms. And in artificial intelligence, if you can uh, draw an algorithm and uh, you have an analysis, <clears throat> you can perfect it with the data. There can be no better country than India with the 27 million babies born here for creating algorithms and a database because data collection is the most important to test the artificial intelligence. As you can see in this uh, cartoon, the predictive analytics and other things uh, are all uh, given with the data. And uh, I think uh, Hila explained how uh, it, is, it works with the algorithms to identify the risk factors and use the output. If we can identify any baby born for any mother who, for example, has uh, um, high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, the risk of this baby developing RDS, PDA, NEC, is this, this, then you can actually predict those things and prepare rather than treating once the problems appear. And if algorithms can identify which babies are at risk for these, for example, if a baby is born at 34, 35 weeks, you're not sure whether to admit to the NIC or not. And if you know the risk factors for respiratory distress for this baby, jaundice and uh, temperature instability, then we can use that either for discharge or admission to the NICU in various ways. Readmissions and uh, various other things are showing that there is an increased cost. So this can actually cut down the cost. Secondly, <clears throat> I showed the data of the various states. So with the various states having uh, such a huge discrepancy in mortality, morbidity data, we can actually use that as a hub and spoke model for referring the babies uh, to the uh, higher center before it's too late to reduce the morbidity and mortality. So if algorithms can identify the risk of babies for hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypothyroidism, HIE, then definitely we can make a huge difference to the neonatal mortality in a big way. So any baby who is born between 34 and 36 weeks, we know that it is a late preterm baby. But the more preterm the baby is, the higher the risk of uh, respiratory distress and sepsis and apnea, we all know. But which baby do you admit if the baby is more than two kilos? Which baby do you send them to an neonatal unit? Or which baby do you discharge early? So this is where artificial intelligence can help us if we have algorithms identify the risk factors and give us these are the babies which you need to watch out. These are the babies you can safely discharge. And for that, we need a lot of data and definitely we can do that. If we do that, <clears throat> the cost of treatment of a premature baby can drastically come down and there can be a lot of the savings, which is this is just a projection of the cost saving which can have uh, in, in identifying the problems. So in other words, the goals and objectives of artificial intelligence in neonatology is early identification and intervention and reduction of the childhood disability. So artificial intelligence algorithms involves a lot of data input from various professionals and algorithms analyzing those data and going from there. Um, I'm running a bit fast so that we can have time more for discussions. If you want to uh, interrupt me at any stage, please do so. So similarly, we don't screen the babies for complex cyanotic cranial heart disease throughout the country, but if artificial intelligence can identify at-risk babies, we can definitely reduce the number of babies who needed to undergo the test, reduce the cost, and reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with that. I don't need to emphasize on congenital hypothyroidism because we know that this is a high incidence in India, but if artificial intelligence can give us the prediction by either doing a cord blood or anything at uh, sooner than later, even early discharge probe babies can be identified much earlier. India has one of the highest incidences of congenital adrenal hypoplasia, and we all know that we our traffic lights are uh, always occupied by hijras and other people. And the reason because it's a delayed diagnosis and no, no treatment 
and these can be avoided if we can predict the babies with the artificial intelligence. Extreme prematurity, attending any delivery is an emergency, we all know, but especially so of the extreme preterm babies. If we can identify which lady is going to go to extreme premature delivery, then we can do the hub and spoke model and refer that lady to regional center in utero to prevent the problems from causing. So artificial intelligence in newborn or neonatology can help us intervene and do things by having the team ready for ABCDE much earlier than later. And especially in an extremely premature baby, we all know that hypothermia, hypoxia, hypercapnia, and hypotension are very, very common, which accounts for almost 70% of the morbidity and mortality, which can be decreased by appropriate algorithms identifying these babies for risking. We all know that India has a highest uh, retinopathy of prematurity because of various reasons which uh, beyond our discussion today. But if we can identify the risk babies and we can reduce the amount of uh, time involved in the ophthalmologist doing the screening on all babies rather than just doing the high risk babies and make sure that uh, we don't miss any ROP. Similarly, deafness, if you identify the babies at risk, a lot of the rural areas will benefit from by getting screened only the at risk babies so that we don't provide the different babies. So artificial intelligence has great expectations and we have a lot of data available. We have a lot of births available in India. We have to work through the artificial intelligence and algorithms to get there. And uh, it is not a quick process as Dr. Shoshana uh, explained, and uh, certainly we can reverse the Kubler-Ross change curve by creating the integration of the data into decision making, and uh, we can experiment that, and we can definitely improve the neonatal care. So neonatal care to move into the next century, and India to become a developed country, we have to invest, and we have to focus on artificial intelligence. That is my few minutes of wisdom. And uh, I was asked to do this lecture only a few days ago. So I prepared this with the stimulating thoughts so that the younger mind can definitely take up this project and work on it. And we can guide anybody who is interested to go through this. And certainly we have a raw material. We have the intention. We have the funds. We just need to work on it so that uh, we are the leaders in the area. Back to you, Prashant. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, so before we start the discussion, we have three panelists today, Dr. Prakash Mehta, Dr. Mega, and Dr. Lena. So uh, I request them to share their views uh, about uh, today's presentation. We'll start with uh, Dr. Prakash Mehta, sir. He's the president of uh, uh, Fetal Medicine uh, Association of State. Uh, Prakash, sir, over to you, sir. Yes, I think it's a very, very interesting concept, point number one. Point number two, as it has been repeatedly pointed out by all the speakers, the data is very, very important. Point number three, I think economics, if you see in the general oh, population thanks. overall, could be a little bit of a problem, but if you, as far as high-risk pregnancies go, I think that should not be an issue at all because any woman who has had a previous uh, uh, a pre eclampsia complication or a previous preterm labor, I, I, I don't think she's going to look at that kind of a cost. I can give you some very simple examples. Just a few days back, I had a lady coming into the hospital for delivery at 30 weeks, unbooked. She was booked in one of the government hospitals and then she came over suddenly to us. And uh, I, I was really worried as to how things would go because the baby needed ventilation and everything else. But she did pay up. So what I'm saying is that we just cannot look only at the financial aspect. Because given a choice, given a choice, a patient will somehow do the things. The more important point I would think is the data building because a computer tells you what you have taught it. If we don't teach it properly or if you have a bias while teaching the while making the program, it is definitely going to make an effect. Number three, the amount of epigenetic influence in India is 
something that is phenomenal, whether you take preeclampsia, whether you take preterm labor, or whether you take postpartum hemorrhage. So I think a lot of hard work is required. Uh, I would say if, if, if we all determine to work, maybe in the next decade or so, we should, have, we should be having a strong database based on which we could build up this kind of artificial intelligence system. Whether we like it or not, that is the future. And for anybody worried, artificial intelligence is never going to replace experience. It can never replace experience. What, what it will do is to help us to treat our patient in a better way, more precision, more cost saving, uh, more uh, uh, co less complications and less litigations. That is what is going to happen. That would be my take on this. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash sir. Kishore sir, would you like to say something? Kindly unmute, sir. Yeah. Uh, Hila, at the outset, I want to congratulate you for the wonderful presentation and uh, the wonderful work you have done on Genesis. I wanted to ask you how long uh, have you been working on this uh, maternal uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms? Um, five years. Five years. Wow. And uh, it's, now it's you have work that can be done in one day, but um, you know to accumulate and um, as uh, as just Professor Mata just said. Um, it is very important um, to uh, to be very precise while building and while using this data. So that's the reason that it takes that long, you know, because sometimes we have other uh, restrictions also in this space that, you know, building by um, old methodologies and all that things. And when we are trying to use AI, as something that will shed light on new uh, parameters and new uh, other things that are important that we weren't aware of in the past, then it takes very long time, you know, to open it first and then to validate these things. Um, and that's the reason that um, that we worked on it that long. No, no, I do understand. I think. Uh... The reason I ask this question is the audience should know that artificial intelligence doesn't happen overnight and it is a long, long process. And once you have created the algorithms, uh, getting the accuracy with the algorithms is so important. I'm very impressed with your algorithms, giving the prediction of gestational diabetes, hypertension. And uh, last time when we spoke, you mentioned about reduction of uh, C-sections. Maybe you can uh, highlight that point here, Hila, because I think India in the private sector has got one of the highest C-sections. Though nobody admits it, the C-sections in India in private sector is almost 60 to 70 percent. So maybe your artificial intelligence can help that to bring down uh, significantly. Uh, again, I am talking uh, on a non-confirmed source uh, on the private sector, but uh, just maybe throw your light on how how your artificial intelligence reduced the C-sections in uh, your uh, trials? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if uh, if Dr. Uh, Paidas uh, from the University of Miami has joined us uh, here, but if so, I want to uh, to congratulate you and thank you for for joining us, uh, Dr. Paidas. And the reason that I mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Paidas is that um, the same numbers um, are being seen in, in Miami population, where we see, you know, 40% of uh, cesarean sections, which is the highest rate in, in the US, actually. Um, and regarding your question, uh, Dr. Kishore, um, since we are predicting, you know, uh, whether uh, we will have uh, any um, any of these complications during the LND, as Dr. Aberman mentioned before then, um, it is helping us to see whether these patients need uh, to have uh, the cesarean section or not. And also, you know, other uh, other complications in LND, for example, is the shoulder dystocia. So if we know that this patient is not going to have any of these complications, then we can make more precise decision on the model of delivery, right? I'm not uh, not to mention, you know, breach uh, presentation and other things like that. 
But in general, if we see that or if we predict that there will no uh, any complications, then it is helping us to make the decision to go with the uh, vaginal delivery. I just have a I, I just have a question. Do you add multiomics or proteomics genomics uh, when you make your artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithms? Are you have you been adding that? Yes, of course. So as Dr. Aberman mentioned, there were challenges. You know, uh, genetic data is pretty it's something that, of course, we all know, but uh, it's not something that. Uh, uh, has been used in the past uh, years in daily, let's say, in daily or very frequent examinations. So it was pretty rare. So what we've done in the places that we did have this genetic data, we combined in a very unique way, and she showed it uh, in this uh, table that is shedding light, you know, on the religions, races, ethnicities, etc. And we have done this combination uh, between the uh, different demographics data that we have to different biological uh, signs that we see, as well as genetic data. So then it puts us in a position where we are able to uh, impute, complete these missing elements, sometimes, you know, in genetic data and get over it using, you know, different parameters that we see in common for a specific uh, population. Yeah, just one more question to add on to that. Uh, have you used uh, any electrohistrography to identify incoordinate uterine action using artificial intelligence? You're talking about elastography, right? Yeah, the uh, labor, the labor uh, procedures. That's that's very interesting. Unfortunately, elastography pretty, <laughs> I don't know how to say, disappeared from this uh, space of ultrasound and other spaces. Um, and for those who are not familiar with what is elastography, um, it is just a way to uh, to uh, examine the um, mechanism or not the mechanism, but the, the mechanics. Sorry, the mechanics of the organ um, to see whether it's stiff or etc., and uh, to have a better estimation using this tool. So this is uh, just closing this parenthesis. Um, and and regarding uh, your question, um, so I've worked personally a lot around this uh, space of elastography and what I've shown uh, before then, maybe I can share it, reshare it again just for, for the purpose of answering this uh, question. So uh, if you see it here, okay, so one of the things that uh, we were an, uh, able to, to do here is to put uh, some uh, uh, sensors on this, uh, on this uh, smart add-on, what we call smart add-on, um, and uh, collect uh, the, the parameters of the, of the uh, tissue and to see what is the different you know, uh, characteristics of this tissue. It was very important because the uh, studies that have done so far with this uh, elastography was around just, uh, you know, uh, uh, pressure, putting, applying pressure on the, on the tissue. The issue with that was that it was inaccurate and it was inaccurate because, you know, we are applying pressure on the fundus of the woman, but you don't know what is the pressure that you are applying. As, and and we all know about you know uh, the Newton uh, the Newton laws that if you are applying pressure on something it will resist in the same pressure, and if you don't know what is the pressure and you don't know what is the area that you are pushing then it's inaccurate. So Absolutely. that's exactly what we we have done to make it more accurate. We are as you can see here the signals. We are measuring what is the uh, pressure that is being applied on the fundus, and then we are measuring here the same pressure what we get from the, the other side through the transducer. And by doing so, we are connecting the picture to see what is the, the real elastography picture God, with a lot of other parameters, by the way. So yeah. it was pretty long answer, so. Now, just last question. Now, when you do sure. the data mining, uh, how, how do we protect the patient rights? Because uh, the, the data That's mining becomes important. very important. 
Definitely. And as I mentioned before, then, um, as someone that came from the cybersecurity space, and I've started uh, my, my career in the cyber uh, security, um, it is something that we, we put in on, on our top of our priorities. Um, and we have very clear and I would say strict process to clean out the patient data. And what we are doing, the first thing, we are cutting off all the data and we keep the data, the personal data, or what we call the PHI data under the EPA laws and the GDPR laws in the hospitals. And this is very, very strict uh, in, in our company and we are working closely with the Microsoft team around all these things of you know integrations making sure that all the integration is very secured and you know cut all the data the phi data and keep it in the in the hospital you know i ask that because our ethics committee is so strong that uh, they will not allow us to touch so many things sometimes we are even more strict than the hospitals i have to say that but uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, one final thing that we may face in India is, say, like when you need an ultrasound picture to build up the base, you need to share the ultrasound picture. It could be just for uh, NT or it could be for FGR to see the femur size or whatever. Uh, but in India, we have the PNDT Act. And under the PNDT Act, we are not allowed to share the pictures. So I don't know how we are going to overcome this when we try to bring... Uh, you know, uh, build the data on it because without an ultrasound examination, none of the data are going to be complete. Um, see, there are first uh, you can take the outcomes of the ultrasound examination, right? The bottom, let's say the bottom line or the diagnosis out of it. So it's not that barrier. Having said that, there are ways to identify also the images. There are simple ways, well-known ways to do it. So it's just, you know, to present to the IT people the way that you're identi they're identifying the data. And it, it is a bit more challenging to do it on data that is coming from tables. That is true. But it's uh, doable, definitely doable. And uh, we, we are doing so everywhere in the world. I mean, uh, in Europe, we are... Uh, no, I think we are the only country in the world which has got a PNDT Act. We are the only yes, country. But, you know, it's everywhere because in, the, in Europe, we are subject to uh, GDPR. In, uh, in the US, we are subject uh, to, uh, to EPA laws. So, you know, everyone has these restrictions. Dr. Mehta, you are not sharing the data with anybody. You are analyzing your own data with artificial intelligence algorithm. So, right. PNDT doesn't come into no, but picture. But when we build the algorithm, we need the complete database. Correct, correct. Because so before building the algorithm, you are not sharing like, the data with anybody. The Indian babies. This is the femur length at this particular stage, or this is the NT, how it has to go. This is the cut which the machine is going to pick up. So the machine needs at least 3,000, 5,000 pictures before it builds up that algorithm. So no, I'm no, talking no, about that right. stage. What I'm saying is you're not sharing the data with anybody. You're sharing right. the data with the computer, which does the algorithm and calculations. So right. I don't think PNDT Act will come into that. The because picture has to be given. The picture the baby. PNDT picture has to be given. with the sex of the baby. Exactly. The picture of a baby has to be shared because let us say, for example, you take femur length. If I'm, if I'm doing biometry and I'm depending on an artificial intelligence to give me the fetal biometric value, then I have to share the femur picture with the initially, at least till the database is built. Um, so uh, after having said that, you know, um, the advantage that we have on images is that, you know, images has no difference between one population to another. So you have the same, uh, you know, you will see, for example, abnormalities within FHR, they will look the same uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, the US or the same in Israel or the same in Europe. And then if we are uh, using the same algorithm to analyze these uh, images or signals, on that part, it will be totally fine. And the, the part that will make the difference will be the, the other data, the entire data, you know, the lab test, so, um, the genetic test, and etc. So I on that part, we are on the safe side. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Balaji. Sir, uh, just to uh, answer your question, 
uh, we don't uh, need the images also sir we can only take the report ultrasound report which has a femur length and bp and all the measurements and that can be incorporated in the software so ultrasound images are not mandatory yeah okay i think that makes it much better yeah if image is not needed then how to we need to have some certification some authentication for unless we see the image we will not be able to rely on it um so it That's was a little uh, bit of a catch 22 situation particular to our country uh i don't know i think over the few next few years we may be able to get around to it god only knows uh but i think as far as pre eclampsia diabetes uh preterm yeah. labor uh, parturition uh, we should be able to do quite well with an artificial intelligence at least the next one decade or so if not longer and as i mentioned before then we already trained these algorithms on a massive population for um, i mean for the uh, imaging um so that is uh, something that will not need to retrain on different population this is what is unique with imaging right um so this is just an advantage here that will just need uh, to provide the algorithm as is so no need uh, to extract uh, any data or image data outside sure. uh if you have any questions uh, audience they can raise their hands dr mega yes you have raised your hand uh, yeah it's a very good idea uh, and innovative too and that is definitely going to improve our evidence based practice especially as dr mehta has said about preeclampsia preterm labor and gestational diabetes it's going to help us a lot in that uh, situation and one more thing uh, as a private practitioner uh, i would say that uh, this is going to help us to counsel the patient and the family about the grievancy of the situation and the complications she is likely to have with the algorithm and that is really going to help us in uh, private practice also thank you uh, thank you heela friedman it was a very informative lecture and i am really thankful to you all thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you dr mega uh, audience do you have any question you can directly unmute and uh, ask our panelist and our uh, speaker um dr lena i just had a break in my internet uh, dr lena are you there yeah uh, ganesh ji would you like to uh, add something before we um, uh, close the session prashant yes sir yes sir it's a very wonderful talk kishor sir very nice both the speakers other both the speakers are very good i don't think uh, there will be much problem about the even ultrasound biophysical profile this thing because we are not showing anywhere the sex determination here and one more thing we are not even uh, revealing anything other than what we need the chest biophysical profile whatever the five six components are there so we are not going to oh, just we are adding that and uh, even cervical length and other things we are adding so it is very good actually artificial intelligence number one in the predicting the delivery so more than and in the neonatology there are two more things what i have seen in my eyes it is already there like icon i c o n icon oc pack company medicals oc pack it is from us okay so that machine just put three probes one is near the neck left neck another is near the left apical region another is just below the apical region so that three probes will and spo2 and hp percentage we have spo2 
uh, we have to uh, enter HB percentage. We have to enter. That's it. And uh, HB percentage, SPO2 and NIBP. But everything is available. One more thing, Icon, Visaka, that is a higher end version. It will cost 27 lakhs. So only if you will bargain, it will come down the price. So with the Mesimo technology incorporated in that, just by seeing the SPO2, NIBP, and uh, three patches, one patches near the left keratin, another one near the apical bit, another one near the, uh, what is it, uh, femoral for the neonate, for the pediatric and adult, another one near the, just below the costo left costochondric angle. If you will, with only that patch, it will give the cardiac output, cardiac index, if you will enter the body surface area, BSA, or if you will write the length and weight, it will only calculate you are going to get what is systemic vascular resistance. All the parameters with the calculations it is giving. You need not worry about what is the cardiac output, what is afterload, preload, whether it is increased, decreased, everything it will only give. And more than that, even lung fluid capacity. And what is the compliance? That itself, everything it is giving. That is one more new thing in the neonatology. It is there. I think so. It is one is there in the at present they are studying in India in St. John's pediatric ICU. Another one is PGI. It's a very good machine. It is. And then another one is Hero Score. That is also with all the bioparameters. It will only tell when whether baby will deteriorate. In Near, that is also artificial intelligence. It is very well in neonatology. That is also there. Hero score one, icon one. And one more thing is there in the neonatology whether this baby will succumb immediately, whether it will be after the, because if the premature baby is delivered, whether because of the infection it is delivered or not. There is total fluid length capacity and the not culture sensitivity and other things. There is one more algorithmic parameter with that. That is also there predicting whether this baby will die or not, like oxygen index and other things. These are the three things I have seen recently in the neonatology, and that is with artificial intelligence and calculations, everything is there. Without not even one is invasive. Everything is non-invasive. So over to Prashant. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I think we had a very uh, good uh, present. Yeah, yes, sir. One, yes, sir. More, one, more, one more doubt. Yeah, uh, are you working on uh, any kind of an algorithm? Because I came across one of the articles recently that uh, GDM, uh, gestational diabetics, going going on to develop diabetes in future. Are you working on it or do you have any experience in it? Yes, of course. We already have these uh, predictions uh, in, uh, in place. Uh, we are working on new publications. Uh, a lot of publications are on the go. Uh, with different uh, with different collaborators, and I see that Dr. Uh, Rob Coppell just uh, dropped out. Maybe joined in again, but um, he's one of the neonatologists that um, are advising the company around. You know, he's uh, with Northwell and uh, are advising the company around everything around the neonatology. So we have now RDS prediction, we have sepsis, um, we have other complications uh, like this. And um, the advantage here is that we are providing these predictions at the very first day, as I mentioned before then and showed our uh, platform. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we had a great discussion. Uh, about the uh, the thing which is already there, which is uh, giving a great prediction of uh, high risk pregnancy and prevention of complication. So it's always uh, the obstetricians and neonatologists hand in hand, which can create a very bright and uh, very healthy uh, future of the nation. So and with the artificial intelligence adding to that as a third eye uh, for uh, the neonatologist and obstetrician. Definitely, the, the future is going to be something very good and very um, uh, promising. So, Ila and uh, all our speakers, thank you very much uh, for accepting our request uh, to be part of this webinar session for this uh, new 
uh, type of webinar session. Uh, otherwise, we would have more of a clinical uh, based with pathology, pathogenesis. So this is something which, as I said, it's, it's going to be a third eye for uh, the doctors uh, in terms of anticipation and preventing the risk and complications. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, Ila. Thank you, Dr. Haberman and uh, Dr. Kishore Kumar, sir. So uh, we have our uh, National uh, Neonatal Forum Chapter Karnataka President, uh, Dr. Kotreshi, over here. Sir, would you like to speak a few words and then we will close the session? Kotreshi, sir. Hello, Prashant. Yes, sir. Can, can you hear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Please go ahead, sir. Amongst all the web series, this is a wonderful uh, uh, series because a prematurity can be prevented or can be taken by the uh, mother itself. And even the instrumental delivery, uh, all, all have been uh, tackled very nicely. And uh, amongst all the guest speakers, uh, I appreciate the involvement of uh, their uh, subject also. So uh, on behalf of uh, Karnataka NNF, I am very proud to say uh, this type of series have been conducting so nicely and is the best serial among us the preterm care has been taken care of. And I am very much thankful for the speakers and participants also. Nice of Prashant. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so this webinar session wouldn't have been possible without the support of uh, Mr. Ganesh and the Genvax. Uh, we have made it possible and this information is going to reach uh, each and every one and we'll be uploading this in our uh, official NNF Karnataka chapter uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel as well. So we will be sharing the link. So I request uh, our uh, participants to kindly share the link and uh, spread the information among our groups. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Have a great. Uh, before closing, Kishore Kumar, sir, would you like to say something? Well, Prashant, nothing other than I uh, wanted to congratulate Hila on the wonderful work and uh, hopefully we should uh, use uh, the software to reduce the mortality and morbidity in India in a huge way because uh, we still have, we are one of the very few countries with a very high uh, maternal mortality. So even if we reduce the maternal mortality by uh, 10, that's a saving of a huge number. And uh, the cost uh, of saving such mothers is, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, enormous. So I think uh, such a simple uh, artificial intelligence can make uh, early referral to regional centers, which can save the mother and uh, um, help a lot of families. There should not be any delay. I think uh, we should start using the private sector and then we should start using it in the public sector soon. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, thank you. Have a great Sunday evening. We'll thank catch up again. Much, yes, Ila, would you like to say something? Yeah, I'm saying thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kishore, and thank you, uh, uh, Ganesh, for arranging this uh, talk. Um, it was a great pleasure, and thank you, everyone. We are looking forward uh, to collaborating with you all, and uh, you know, for the best of the the uh, mothers and the uh, uh, babies uh, in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Sunday evening. We'll catch up uh, in, in next in Tuesday and Sunday again. Bye bye.